Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody to today's session. Uh, it's going to, the topic is actually on respiratory infection management of cough um, on today. Our speaker is uh, Eric Mugambi um, Nturubi. Uh, Eric Mugambi is uh, the director of programs and adjunct faculty in uh, university, I'm sorry, I think, uh, yeah, it's in university of Nairobi uh, and a Chris Plus project. Dr. Tari would uh, probably give us more information on uh, what Chris Plus project. I think uh, the topic you're speaking about today is timely. And I was actually very happy and enthusiastic to join in because cough is a big issue, uh, personally affected. It's good to learn more about what, how we can manage cough and the different types of cough. So we cannot wait to, to hear from, from you and what you have to, to teach us. Welcome, Dr. Eric. Dr. Eric. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Gulit. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, this uh, project, CRIS Plus Projects, uh, uh, you know, that's an acronym for Central Kenya uh, Response uh, Integration, Strengthening and Sustainability Project. So this is basically a PEPFA funded uh, project that is, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a supporting, you know, comprehensive HIV uh, care and treatment uh, in two counties of Kenya. So we've been active in Kiambu and Kirinyaga, that's for the past uh, uh, 10 years. So the project is really, uh, you know, almost coming. Wow. To, to an end. Uh, so uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, maybe just a, a quick introduction. Uh, so I think I will just uh, share my screen uh, with your permission. And then we could, uh, we could start off. Yeah, kindly. Excuse me, Dr. Amina. Yes. I'm uh, being informed that Dr. Frank uh, has a few remarks to start with before the actual presentation. Yeah, kindly, Dr. Frank. Apologies. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be uh, with you. I'm Dr. Frank Wam. I'm the uh, medical advisor uh, for group of Group Echika for Sanofi. And today uh, we have the pleasure with Dr. Eric Mugambi to offer you this CMA on cough. And I hope uh, that uh, you will enjoy uh, the presentation. And with all the team in Dread and all the team in Kenya, I hope uh, you uh, will uh, share uh, uh, all the questions you have about cough. And I think Dr. Mugambi will try to answer uh, the question. So it's a real pleasure for me. Um, normally I should be in Kenya for the session, but uh, due to the cancellation of my flight, I'm still in Cameroon, Douala, but I will be there very soon. And I'm happy to share this CME with you. So Dr. Mungambi, thank you. And you have the floor. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Frank about the flights. I'm sorry you're one of the affected with KQ but we are more than happy to have you when you come. Uh, Dr. Eric, um, you can start the presentation. Go ahead with the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Dr. Frank, uh, thank you for your remarks, opening remarks. Uh, so uh, th this is an important uh, presentation, uh, presentation on cough. It's not every day that uh, uh, you know, we, we, we sit and uh, devote some time to this. Uh, I recall when I first did this presentation, that was uh, some time back in 2011. Um, and you know, at that time we were doing the, the first version of the Kenya Asthma Guidelines. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was pleased to have, uh, you know, served as the assistant editor for those guidelines. And during that time, we were doing a lot of talks, uh, you know, regarding cough and, uh, you know, regarding asthma. 
And uh, basically, as I was say, uh, you know, looking at uh, you know those old slides, I realized that a lot has changed, eh? and it's really my my pleasure to, to to share with you, you know, just a few insights, uh, you know, on uh, uh, what uh, uh, these updates are, you know, what's 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 a, a state of art in terms of uh, uh, cough uh, uh, management. Okay, so I think uh, maybe my slides are a bit uh, stuck. Uh, just allow me to reshare my screen again. And uh, we keep our fingers crossed. Just hope that now this will, this will move. Fingers crossed. <laughs> very, yeah, very much so. Uh, and uh, this really worked very well at some point. Uh, uh, another time, let me just see whether. Uh -huh. so maybe while you're doing that, um, I can shed light more about who okay. Dr. Eric is. Uh, Dr. Eric is a physician. He's also done um, some diploma, uh, postgraduate diploma in endocrinology. Uh, also is a member of many, many uh, associations, including KME, uh, Respiratory Society of Kenya, Friends of Commonwealth Foundation. He's an author to a book called uh, Love Sudan and Other Stories. I like that uh, your diverse doctor, it's very beautiful when we have doctors who go far and beyond. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's also published many articles in relation to, to many aspects of uh, internal medicines. Doctor, I don't know if uh, your screen is working. Yes, it, it, it seemed to, to work a bit uh, uh, before you, you know, you shared the, your flattering remarks, I think. <laughs> I can go on, I can go on. The list is too many for me to finish. <laughs> yes, let's 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 see uh, whether this will ah, good. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, now that it's working, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harry. Uh, so so very quickly, uh, this is uh, you know a, a cheeky remark. Uh, three things cannot be hidden: uh, coughing, poverty, and love. You know, just underscoring. Uh, uh, you know, the importance of cough and, and basically how uh, ubiquitous cough is. And, and really, this is a brief outline of uh, what we, we will cover today. So we'll start off with a burden of cough, a bit about, uh, you know, epidemiology. We, we might not have, uh, you know, local data, but uh, I'll try to share what, uh, what, what we have, risk factors for cough. Uh, look a bit at the cough reflex arc. Uh, you know, the evaluation of cough and basically, uh, you know, management of, of cough. So very quickly, this is just a global map just showing the distribution of uh, cough prevalence. Uh, you realize that the definitions used in a lot of these studies are, are quite different. The population studies are also uh, different. Uh, but generally, it is thought that, uh, you know, the regions that are most affected, uh, you know, by, by, by cough are where prevalence is highest. I think you can see Europe, you can see around, uh, uh, you know, the UK and, and Australia. Uh, so basically, it, you know, it does seem that, uh, you know, the Western world as it is, uh, you can see also uh, North America, uh, that, uh, you know, that is where we do have... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, cough. It could also be that, you know, that is where uh, cough has been studied uh, substantially. Uh, this is an, an interesting study that I was able to pick up. And, and basically this was looking at uh, the burden of common infectious disease syndromes, uh, comparing, you know, a, a center in rural, uh, you know, against a center in urban Kenya. And basically what they saw was that, what they found out was that cough really uh, was, uh, you know, a very common symptom that, uh, you know, led to health seeking behavior. So compared with what uh, we'd call diarrhea days and fever days, 
you can actually see that in both uh, centers, urban and rural, uh, there were 60 and 27 cough days uh, uh, respectively, uh, much more than the days uh, children spent with uh, fever or with loose motions. Uh, so this is also uh, a bit of uh, prevalence of cough in children. This is global prevalence. Uh, you can see from this, uh, some of the countries that we highlighted, like Australia, uh, you know, we talked about uh, North America, uh, we talked about Europe. You can see that's where we do have high, uh, you know, prevalences. But you can see that uh, Fiji does stand out at uh, 22%. So I have to say that, you know, the definition of chronic cough in children is, is a bit different from how uh, we define it uh, among adults. And most people consider cough of more than four weeks duration in children uh, to be chronic uh, cough. Eh? So I think it's just uh, good to, to highlight that, whereas in adults we usually look at uh, maybe more than uh, eight weeks. So cough is really, you know, costly. And then this is, you know, a study that looked at the financial burden. Uh, and, you know, the, mind you, we are talking about acute cough, uh, you know, not live alone uh, chronic cough. And according to this study, this was some time back, the main cost per episode to the NHS, uh, you know, in the UK, uh, you know, to Kenya shillings, that's about 4,000 Kenya shillings. Uh, the mean cost to their parents and caregivers was about 2,200. Uh, the annual cost to the system uh, at the time in 2008 was about 4.6 uh, billion. So basically you can, uh, you know, compare that with our health budget around that time, uh, which was 40 billion. And you can see that, uh, very easily cough might account for about a tenth of uh, the, the, the total budget that is devoted uh, uh, to the healthcare system. Uh, if you look at this in terms of quality of life, uh, you know, in terms of uh, a, a maybe cost per person year, uh, this was also uh, quite high uh, for, for, for acute cough as well as for, for, for chronic cough. And the authors of this paper, uh, you know, concluded that uh, patients with cough uh, did represent a substantial uh, financial burden uh, to the NHS. Uh, this is an interesting study because this was a dissertation uh, done at uh, uh, Kenyatta National Hospital. So this is quite close to our audience. And in terms of time, it's, it's, it was also done, uh, you know, just uh, last year. And uh, this was a study looking at quality of life of children uh, with chronic cough and of their parents. And you can see from the conclusions that, you know, the quality of life was found to be quite, quite low. Uh, uh, you know, and this is for the children as well as for the caregivers. And some of the uh, factors that were associated with a lower quality of life score our uh, age uh, below five years. So this was an odds ratio, uh, you know, of six, uh, you know, six times uh, more likely to, to, to uh, you know, to be affected in terms of quality of life as compared to children above five, and then low parental education and low income. Uh, the other factor that was uh, associated with low quality of life amongst uh, the children uh, was residents near major roads. Eh? So we know that this uh, proximity to roads, this has been studied a lot in relation to, uh, to asthma. And we know that uh, from studies, you know, locally and also, uh, you know, in Ethiopia, that children who resided near major highways did, uh, you know, present, uh, you know, to, to, to the health system uh, with uh, more uh, respiratory uh, symptoms. Uh, so on to chronic cough, because really, uh, you know, cough is so common. And uh, I think all of us know that, uh, you know, in, in most cases, when we get a cough, it, it does go, it, it goes away. Yeah? Uh, so really, chronic cough is what we, we want to, to focus on uh, today. And these are some of the risk factors that have been uh, 
uh, you know, mentioned in the in the literature. Uh, so one is age, and then basically the, the commonest decade for coffee is 60 uh, to, to 69. So this is an adult. So we, and, and really here we, we are not talking about uh, children because of course, uh, uh, under fives do have uh, a lot of burden of cough. <clears throat> we know that, uh, you know, children who sort of grow out of their asthma uh, do so after the age of maybe five or six. Eh? Um, if we look at uh, sex, two thirds of patients seen at cough specialist clinics are women. Uh, this is an interesting uh, issue. Uh, it is thought that, uh, you know, women, particularly aged 60 to 69, you know, are more likely to come because of, uh, you know, stress, urinary incontinence. Uh, it is thought that, uh, you know, they, they have, you know, a more sensitive cough reflex, uh, ETC. So basically, there are reasons that have been postulated to explain that. Uh, we have genetic mutations. These uh, mutations in the receptors, uh, which we can, I think, uh, for simplicity, call cough receptors. And, and, and really, if you do have mutations in those uh, receptors, uh, then you are likely to, to present with uh, you know, chronic cough. And then uh, there are sensitizers and irritants. So here we are talking about air pollution, occupational fumes, gases, uh, cleaning products. Uh, I think uh, smoking, this is... Uh, something that is well known to, to you know, all of us. Uh, viral infections, uh, uh, you know, this is really any respiratory virus. Uh, and in particular, after, you know, we, what we call COVID, uh, we know that 10 to 20% of our patients uh, might have, uh, you know, chronic cough. And then of course, there is the whooping cough that's caused by uh, pertussis and this can, can, can actually uh, be quite troublesome. It can last for you know for months. Um, uh, in 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 patients who have you know a normal chest X-ray, they're not smokers. Then most of uh, you know their their chronic cough uh, in some series fifty one to ninety two percent is taken to be due to these conditions. Eh? So basically, these are conditions that affect. Uh, uh, the anatomical structures that are inhabited by, you know, by the vagus nerve, eh? and 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 therefore, you know, we have like the upper airway cough syndrome. This used to be called, you know, post nasal drip, uh, gastroesophageal reflux. We have cough variant asthma, uh, you know, and and we have uh, an anasmatic eosinophilic uh, bronchitis. So it is actually thought that these are the ones that are really responsible for uh, most of the cough, uh, you know, in people with a normal uh, chest X-ray and, and, and those who do not, do not smoke. And I think you'll see in the evaluation that these are the, the, the issues that are usually evaluated uh, first. And then of course, there are patients who have the uh, abnormal X-rays. And here we are talking of uh, all the uh, uh, types of lung diseases. Uh, you know, from airway diseases, parenchymal diseases, we have diseases that affect the, you know, the lung interstitium. Uh, we have, uh, you know, cough that could be related to, uh, you know, some uh, exposure to occupational dust. So we have the cough that's related to uh, therapies like ACE uh, inhibitors. Uh, so very quickly, uh, now, cough really can be defined as an expulsive uh, motor act. Uh, in, in most uh, books, you'll actually find that, uh, you know, there are three phases that are, that are usually uh, mentioned. Uh, there is that inspiratory phase, uh, which uh, really just generates sufficient uh, uh, air and pressure, uh, you know, to be able to uh, generate an effective cough reflex. Because remember, the cough reflex is a protective reflex. And then there is a compressive phase where the glottis uh, is closed, just really build that uh, pressure. And then there is that expansive uh, phase. Um, um, you know, in some cases uh, during your reading, you might come across the recovery phase. And, and really this is a deep inspiration that uh, usually uh, follows a, a cough. 
Uh, this is really just a graph of uh, you know the the, the airflow, uh, inspiratory and expiratory, uh, during these phases of uh, of cough that uh, you know we have uh, talked about. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so let me just uh, take a sip of water. Now, uh, this, this is interesting. So in terms of uh, what are called semantics of cough, uh, you know, we, we, we attribute cough to many things. Yeah? And we have many descriptions that, uh, you know, we use. And, you know, sometimes we talk about habit cough, we talk about Tourette-like cough, we talk about, uh, you know, we, you know, sensation of throat clearing. Uh, we talk about urge to cough. We can describe the... Uh, uh, a cough in terms of what brings it up. Uh, we also have pathological descriptions like bovine cough, you know, dry, moist, hacking, uh, ETC. Uh, I, th I think in most guidelines, you'll actually see that we, we define cough on the basis of the duration. And really there's nothing in the duration that is, uh, a, you know, that uh, is supported by evidence as such. This is just an expert opinion. And, and usually we talk about an acute cough as lasting less than three weeks uh, in adults, then subacute, uh, three to eight, and then chronic more than uh, eight eight weeks. Uh, sometimes we do talk about a normal cough uh, as you know you uh, tasia, and then there is hypertasia that's an increased uh, uh, cough, hypo uh, tasia, uh, you know, reduced cough. Uh, distasia is what we tend to get when uh, you know somebody has uh, uh, some illness and, and you know that cough is uh, uh, pathological and then sometimes we do have cough that is uh, depressed uh, when 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 it ought not to be and i think you'll actually see that you know one of the challenges in developing effective cough therapies is actually to 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 get a fine balance between a, you know, a maintaining a good cough reflex, and then also, uh, uh, you know, controlling that uh, sort of uh, uh, what we might call cough hypersensitivity. Uh, so, so that's the fine balance that uh, that you know we want to to, to achieve. Uh, this is a you know just a, a, a representation of the cough reflex. Huh? And basically coming all the way from, from the receptors, we talked about cough receptors. As uh, so these receptors are, are, are you know, spread uh, you know, pre, uh, throughout the respiratory tract all the way from the, from the larynx, it is also thought that they, they, they are also uh, present in the lung parenchyma itself. Uh, most of them are in the airways, but it is thought that uh, they, they, they are also in the parenchyma itself. Of course, we also know that uh, they are present in the stomach as, as well. So really, if you follow the, the, the path of uh, the, the vagus nerve, uh, including in the ear canal, ear drums, you will find that uh, uh, you know we have receptors that are involved in the cough reflex uh, arc. And then of course, uh, this uh, through the vagus nerve, this uh, uh, you know peripheral sensations are related to uh, the cough center. This is in the brainstem, in the medulla, and the, in the medulla, uh, and particularly in the nucleus tractus uh, solitarius, and also what we call the paratrigeminal uh, nucleus. Uh, of course, we do know that uh, you know sometimes depending on you know your situation, this could be social situation. Sometimes you can suppress a cough, eh? and then you know the, uh, uh, this has to do with cortical. Uh, stimulation. So we do have lots of centers. We do have a lot of cortical, uh, uh, you know, input into, into the cough. This is usually suppressive, but sometimes we can also mimic a cough. <laughs> we, we, could, we could do that. Eh? So there's also a bit of uh, that volitional uh, control of cough. And it is thought that in patients who have this, uh, you know, uh, hypersensitivity, then there, there is sometimes a problem with uh, uh, those uh, descending uh, pathways that are meant to, uh, to 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 inhibit cough. Of course, there are many drugs that 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 work at, at at this level, and I think we will just mention a few of them. And then, of course, you have the the effector muscles, these are expiratory muscles. Uh, unfortunately, also the pelvic sphincters uh, 
I think are, are involved in this, a diaphragm, uh, larynx, trachea, uh, bronchi, and these are the, the nerves that uh, uh, you know power up these uh, uh, effector uh, systems. So this is just really uh, a very concise, uh, very objective, but also very academic description of the cause reflex. Which really, I think, when we share out these slides, uh, you you can uh, you know you can uh, have 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 a look at. So very quickly on cough hypersensitivity, uh, these are some of the characteristics that uh, you know they make us uh, feel that uh, there is hypersensitivity to cough. So this is where innocuous stimuli provoke cough. So this is alotasia. And then also a low cost threshold eh? uh, to, to, to stimuli that, that, that indeed do, uh, we know should provoke cough, but we find that, uh, that the threshold is quite lower. Uh, there is that uncontrollable urge to cough that uh, our patients uh, talk about. And it is important to note that laryngeal hypersensitivity uh, often uh, coexists. So it, it is important, I think, to note that, you know, you cannot tell about hypersensitivity or what the cause of a cough is uh, from how the cough sounds. Eh? Uh, it, it is just good for us to, uh, to have that uh, in mind. Uh, what evidence do we have, uh, you know, to, to uh, when we say that, uh, that there is this entity called uh, cough hypersensitivity? Uh, the, these are some of these, uh, uh, you know, lines of, of evidence. I think we've talked about the clinical profile that might make us suspect that uh, there is hypersensitivity, cough hypersensitivity. But also, of course, uh, uh, we, 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 there is evidence for sensory neural, neural activation in the airways. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, studies that uh, uh, usually in animal uh, models, that show alterations in the you know, sort of central uh, processing of, of cough. And also we do have clinical trials of, of drugs that have been effective uh, you know, in animal models. And, and more recently we do have, uh, and I will uh, maybe just show you a few slides on it. We do have uh, you know, a drug that uh, uh, you know, has been shown to be effective. Uh, in uh, uh, human human studies. Uh, so again, what really we've talked about, this is really the whole uh, uh, pathway, you know, from all the way from, uh, uh, you know, the, the lungs, the, the, the lung tissue, lung parenchyma, as I said, mostly the, the, the airways, uh, and, and up to, 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 to the brainstem, uh, to the medulla. And then, of course, uh, you know the, the descending, uh, you know, the pathways uh, from the cortex and then from the uh, subcortex. Uh, so I, I think this is something that uh, you know you can look at uh, during uh, your own uh, free time. So really, this is how this cough hypersensitivity syndrome is thought to. Uh, to, 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 to operate. And basically it's thought to be lots of factors coming in together. And this, uh, this could be you know, asthma, this could be other corticosteroid res you know, responsive uh, diseases, uh, you know, rhinosinusitis, uh, reflux, other pulmonary diseases, cigarette smoke, uh, pollution as inhibitors, ETC. And it is actually thought that in these patients with this syndrome, that it is more than one factor. It's actually been demonstrated. It's usually more than one factor uh, that is at, uh, at play. Uh, so uh, how do we evaluate core? And maybe more importantly, why should we evaluate core? So this is important because cough is a portal for spread of infection. Uh, you know, we know cough can give, you know, lots of pain, rib fractures, uh, you know, hernias, you no know, bleeding. Uh, you know, it can worsen uh, hemorrhoids, can actually rupture them. Uh, we could have aneurysms uh, in the brain or elsewhere that uh, also rupture. Uh, and again, of course, we know that it is bothersome. Eh? And sometimes it is worrisome to, to our patients. They are coughing all the time. Uh, cough can be terrifying eh? and quite uh, depleting as well. 
uh, and also it can lead to marital uh, discord. Eh? Uh, and, and I think particularly in this COVID area, the stigma that is associated uh, you know, with, with, with cough. Eh? So there are many reasons why we should evaluate cough. Uh, we do not usually evaluate cough um, uh, you know, the, as per this slide, uh, which basically shows us uh, some of the tools that have been used in clinical trials. Eh? So we do have a uh, cough questionnaires that are looking at uh, you know, cough related quality of life, uh, cough severity just using a simple uh, visual analog uh, scale. Uh, we have objective measures that have been employed in these clinical trials, uh, like the Leicester cough uh, monitor, uh, you know, the HAL automated cough counter, ETC. And of course, we can also test uh, cough uh, reflex sensitivity using the CAPSA uh, you know, tassive uh, challenge. So there is so much really that, uh, that, that, that can, be, can be done, which we, uh, you know, often uh, do, not, uh, do not do. So that's just a representation of uh, the visual analog scale where the, the patient just marks the patient or if it's a clinical trial, the, the, the participant really just marks on a scale of you know zero to two. This, this is usually a hundred millimeters, and just puts a mark in uh, between no cough and, and worst cough ever. Uh, we, we do have some gadgets, some vests that, that also do record the cough activity objectively. So there is a, a sound recorder so that we know that this is indeed a cough. Uh, sometimes it does not distinguish between coughs. Uh, well, it, 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 it will pick out coughs of people who are close to you, but fortunately, because this is, uh, you know, wired, uh, uh, to, to, to monitors, you know, the, the chest wall, uh, to, to look at the mass of excursion. Uh, we have ECG leads and all that. It is possible to differentiate, uh, you know, the patient's cough from, from, from other coughs that, that, that are happening. Eh? Uh, so, so this is what uh, one of the, 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 the gadgets that, that are in use. This one is called the uh, Life Life Shot. Eh? Uh, so this is really just for, for those who are interested in uh, reading a bit more uh, on, on you know, this cough uh, counting counting tool. So, so this is really a recent uh, a review with lots of uh, uh, you know, insights. So really, as mentioned, uh, uh, what, what, what we, we, we'd like to do is preserve a cough reflex, but also suppress a cough that is you know, irritating, that, that is not useful. Eh? And generally this is a, a tenuous balance. Eh? And basically what this means is that uh, um, with a lot of cough suppression therapies, then we worry about uh, this uh, the dystasia, which is really uh, ineffective coughing. Eh? So we do not want our patients to lose that uh, a protective effect that they're getting from the cough, 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 cough uh, uh, reflex. And this has been a problem with a lot of drugs that we use for cough, eh? like the opiates, like the, uh, you know, the GABA agonists and all that. Eh? So of course, you know that uh, anything that uh, targets the central, uh, central nervous system is prone to give us uh, the risk of uh, dictasia. And this is the risk where we can, you know, this is where we can get uh, uh, patients uh, getting, uh, you know, aspiration of uh, uh, gastric contents and, and, and what have you. Eh? Uh, so uh, very quickly, this is how we, we, we evaluate uh, for cough. So, uh, you know, as with uh, anything else, we do take a comprehensive history. Uh, we do uh, a physical examination. And then uh, when we go to cough itself, we can try to uh, you know, we categorize it as per the duration that, that helps us to uh, look at what, uh, you know, the, the common causes might be. Uh, we, uh, you know, we look at uh, impact triggers. We can score using either, you know, the visual analog uh, scale or other scales like the HAL, uh, you know, the uh, quality of life score. And then we, more importantly, uh, you know, uh, if you recall that Venn diagram that uh, we had, uh, we look for associated symptoms. Eh? So we, we want to ask about the throat, uh, the chest, the, the GI. We want to ask about risk factors like case inhibitor use, smoking, sleep apnea, and do a comprehensive physical exam, uh, including examination of the ear. 
I think uh, maybe we have not talked about the Arnold's uh, you know, reflex, which, which is really where when you manipulate the ear, and this is why lots of children when they have ear infections, uh, they, they also are likely to, 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 to cough. Eh? So really that is due to, to, to the auricular branch of uh, the vagus, uh, you know, being involved in that uh, sort of neuropathology. And then, of course, there is what is called routine evaluation. So yeah, just remember now, this is chronic cough. Eh? So for acute cough, we do not uh, need to do chest radiography unless in our history and physical examination, there is an indication. Uh, but for chronic cough, we, we, we recommend a chest radiograph at a minimum. A pulmonary function test, this is pyrometry and, and at least at a minimum. Uh, you know, the nitric oxide, the expired uh, nitric oxide, because uh, uh, this tells us whether, uh, you know, there are inflammatory processes involved and, and uh, whether corticosteroids might be useful. And then also blood eosinophilia. So, so these ones, uh, the, the last two, there is a question mark because, uh, uh, you know, this is expert panel opinion. Uh, and then, of course, the initial management is to stop any risk factors like smoking, exposure to, to allergens that we've been able to identify. Uh, initiate a, you know, a corticosteroid, uh, oral or inhaled, uh, or, a, you know, the, the leukotriene receptor, a, you know, antagonist, uh, particularly when there is evidence that, uh, you know, eosinophilic inflammation is at play here. Uh, and, and really the reason we do this is because when you look at, you know, 50 to, to 92 percent of, of courses that we talked about, uh, we are talking about corticosteroid responsive uh, uh, conditions. Uh, we, you know, we are talking about gastroesophageal reflux, we are talking about FMHS, eh? and that's why we, we do this for, for chronic, chronic cough. Eh? Uh, we initiate a PPI only when there is evidence of uh, acid, acid, uh, um, and then, of course, there is the follow-up uh, follow assessment. We can use the COF score. We can ask about symptoms. Uh, if there is improvement, we can continue, <laughs> uh, you know, the corticosteroids for three months and attempt to two weeks ago. Uh, if there is no improvement, then we can go to the therapies that are being, you know, that are in use uh, for COF. Eh? So these are like the low-dose opiates, uh, gabapentin, pegabalin, uh, ETC. Uh, for motility agents in case, you know, we are dealing with, uh, you know, reflux. And then definitely there is room for additional evaluation because really cough can be caused by all those pathologies that uh, we know it can affect the respiratory system. And therefore there is a, a place for esophageal manometry, especially where we think there is this motility. There is a role for pH impedance studies in this case. Uh, and we are able to, to actually do those locally uh, for our, our patients. Uh, there is the role for the induced sputum for isonophils, uh, you know, role for testing for TB, uh, laryngoscopy, uh, metacolin challenge, chest CT, and uh, bronchoscopy. Now, uh, that was for adults. So, so for children with uh, chronic cough, I, I think you'll see that there is a bit of a, of, of a difference. Uh, and, and really, I think I have to say that uh, this cough hypersensitivity that uh, you know, we've talked about, uh, generally it is not, it's not something that has been demonstrated for children. Eh? So it is very rare to get children uh, who have been coughing for, for, for you know, many months or years, eh? if it is not one of the, the eosinophilic diseases that, that you know, we talked about, like maybe cough variant asthma uh, and, and, and what have you. So for, for children in most cases, uh, you know, following uh, history and physical examination, uh, if they are old enough to perform spirometry, this is a, a, a courage. Uh, if, if we cannot identify anything, you know, with chest X-ray or spirometry, uh, then if it is a dry cough, we do check for irritants. Uh, irritants are very common, uh, you know, uh, within our households. Uh, we do allergy testing in selected cases. And then most importantly, we roll out, uh, uh, you know, protracted uh, bacterial bronchitis. And, and really, I think the message is that for children, 
uh, unless they do have structural uh, lung diseases, uh, it, you know, chronic cough uh, uh, is not something that uh, uh, you know, we, we find very uh, uh, commonly. Yeah? So this is really just a pathway for, uh, for, for, for children who are present with, with chronic cough. And then we do have, a, you know, this concept of unexplained chronic cough. Uh, we also do have what we call a refractory, a chronic refractory cough. Eh? So an explained uh, chronic cough is, you know, situations where we've done all these tests, uh, you know, we've tested, uh, you know, uh, following that anatomical model uh, uh, along the, the vagus nerve. So we've actually tested all that and we have uh, found nothing. Eh? And, and this is a diagnosis that is, that's usually made at uh, what are called cough specialist centers. I think locally, this really would be our pulmonologists who, who are uh, uh, maybe handling, handling these, these, these patients. Eh? And basically for this uh, diagnosis, uh, there is speech language intervention. Uh, we can try uh, neuromodulatory uh, agents or those opiates, and we, we recommend that uh, uh, you know, they participate in, uh, you know, clinical uh, trials. So again, just something that you can look at uh, later, just, you know, regarding speech and language therapy, where the, the key points are really education, uh, promoting vocal hygiene, uh, you know, a, a training, uh, you know, the, the, the patients to activate their, uh, you know, cortical inhibitory uh, pathways. And then, of course, uh, a psychoeducational uh, counseling. Eh? Uh, so, how it, you know do we treat this uh, you know chronic cough that is not due to you know an underlying disease that we have uh, identified, uh, or it could be that we've identified the disease, we've treated the disease, but the cough is uh, refractory. Uh, so what is available, uh, and, and broadly we can look at the, the targets that uh, uh, you know have been uh, uh, used. So uh, we can target the cough centrally, and, and that's what we've been doing up to now. And and we of course we 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 have discussed uh, you know the dangers of doing it at. Uh, at the level of the CNS. Eh? So uh, if we looked at the opiates, if we looked at the, the gabapentinoids, then we know that the uh, uh, CNS side effects are quite common. Eh? And of course, with the opiates, we know that the doses that uh, give us uh, that antitensive effect, then these are doses that invariably cause constipation and drowsiness. Eh? And of course, in children, we worry so much about this because uh, in some cases, children have died eh? just, just because of uh, respiratory uh, depression. Eh? And then another thing about these central these therapies that we have, uh, of course, you know that they were purposed and you know they have been approved for other indications. Eh? Like for instance, and, and really this, you know, like for instance, the, the gabapentin, you know, these are drugs approved for seizure uh, disorders, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and of course we know what we use the opiates for to, to, to relieve, uh, you know, chronic pain. But again, it's useful to say that perhaps only 50% of patients, you know, respond to, to these uh, treatments. And uh, the good thing is that, uh, you know, when, when they respond, if they will respond, then uh, that response happens very fast. Eh? And within a few weeks, it is possible to identify, uh, you know, the people who will respond us and are non-responders. Eh? So some of the central targets, say uh, opioid receptors, histamine H1 receptor, uh, N-methyl D aspartate uh, receptor, and the, uh, the GABA uh, receptor. Now, more, more importantly, and more recently, uh, the, the, and, and of course, tricyclic uh, applications, which uh, are very useful, uh, particularly considering that we can use low doses. Uh, and, and really, if you look at the side effects profile, they, they are probably better than what you get with uh, opiates and, and maybe GABA pentinoids. Eh? So that they are probably more tolerable. Unfortunately, when you stop them, then, then the cough, uh, you know, the cough is back. Eh? So uh, apart from central, uh, more emphasis now has come peripherally. 
And basically, we are targeting the so-called core receptors. And here we are talking about the trip, uh, the trip series of receptors uh, from trip V1 or trip V4 in, in clinical trials, uh, 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 maybe uh, uh, trip, uh, you know, 1 ETC, yeah? and also the P2 uh, X3. So I think, uh, uh, so, so these are the, the novel antitussis in clinical trials. Again, targeting those receptors uh, that we have uh, uh, highlighted. Uh, so th this is really just a table from this uh, recent paper uh, by uh, Song and uh, you know the co-authors, and basically the uh, you know very important uh, table because basically it it does show you the drugs that are in clinical trials, and it does show you the the face. Uh, shows you the, the number of patients. I think you'll be disappointed that this a lot of these trials have very few patients. Eh? And that is one thing about uh, the studies of uh, COF. And uh, the other thing maybe that you'll mention about studies of COF is, the, you know, that big placebo effect. Eh? And sometimes it's very hard to uh, tease that out from a real uh, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic effect. But suffice to say, from this table, you will notice that uh, there is a drug called uh, Gef uh, san and, and really this drug has been shown to be, if, if you look at the, the p-values, uh, uh, if you're the kind of person who is moved by statistics, you will see some p-values on the, on the green. Eh? Uh, you know, and, and basically those ones show you that these uh, 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 products have been shown to be useful in, in, in human uh, trials. Eh? Uh, so for uh, Gefapica, Pixant, you can actually see uh, uh, quite significant. Uh, this is a recent paper, again, of the, the, the same drug, uh, uh, Gefapixant, and, and, and really, uh, th this is a P2X3 receptor antagonist. Uh, of course, you, you, you realize that uh, this did not have, a, uh, you know, lots of uh, a, a, uh, patients in the initial uh, trials, but in this trial that uh, you know we, um, we are looking at, uh, we had four groups uh, of 63 each, so that's a total of about 250. Uh, and then you know there were these groups. There was a placebo a, a group, and then there were three uh, dose dose a, a, a dosing a, a groups uh, up to 50. And, and basically for this drug, it's been shown that they have done 600 milligrams and, and basically they, they realize that everybody got uh, uh, you know, altered test, what we call this, this juice here. And, and uh, even with 50 milligrams, about 50% do get that, uh, that altered test. And 92% of uh, you know, participants were white. Uh, the, the mean BMI was 27.7. And they really took uh, you know, lots of care to uh, make sure that uh, people did not have the uh, asthma or even if they were asthmatic say, and they had uh, maybe chest disease like COPD, that their FEV1, FEC was uh, within normal range. And then interestingly, duration of cough was quite high, 14.5 years. Uh, again, this was a population that 70% uh, uh, had, had never smoked. It is usually very important to try to uh, tease out the effect of uh, of smoking, and I think really what you can you can see here is that at, at higher doses of uh, uh, gefapixant, then uh, uh, we did have a uh, you know a, uh, a reduction in in the cough uh, uh, frequency uh, over a period of uh, uh, twelve weeks. Eh? So you can basically see this is uh, at, at the dose of uh, uh, fifty. Uh, 50 milligrams. And if you look at uh, other measures of cough frequency, be it uh, when patients were awake or, or during the whole day, then you can see that, uh, you know, the, the, the higher doses, uh, 50 milligrams doses, uh, you can see that this is the dose that uh, was, uh, you know, the most effective. Of course, you can compare that with the blue line, which is uh, the, the placebo. Uh, which you can see uh, up there in terms of uh, the number of coughs eh? uh, that that uh, patient, participants uh, experienced, and therefore, really coming to to to, to the last uh, slide, and and I really want to thank you for uh, being so patient. Uh, uh, 
you know, this is after lunch and, and I know it's not easy to, uh, to have these uh, sessions at this time. So what, what, what are the gaps really to be addressed? So we, we still do not have a good understanding of, you know, the relationship between cough hypersensitivity and, and chronic cough. Eh? It, it does seem that this is not a one show fits all scenario. Uh, it, it seems that, you know, the, the cops that we tend to get for different uh, uh, disease conditions uh, are, are a bit uh, different, so to say, yeah? a bit, a bit unique. Uh, of course, I said for children, evidence for cough hypersensitivity is lacking. In fact, uh, if you recall, we mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, our female patients are more likely to present with uh, uh, with 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 the cough and 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 really we did talk about that difference in adults. So in children, that difference between uh, their sex difference is not really there. We we do not have uh, that. Eh? A, again, human neurophysiological studies are quite limited. Uh, the animal models that we use, like uh, particularly guinea pigs and cats, those are the ones that have been used. Uh, we have to. Um, you know, we, we sort of have to provoke the cough. Eh? These are not animals that cough the way humans, humans do. And there are people who have problems with trying to translate these uh, studies to humans. In fact, some therapies that are effective in animal models, like the TRIP uh, uh, V1 antagonists, which were effective, uh, were very disappointing in human uh, trials. Eh? So just basically to tell you that uh, uh, you know, there is a disconnect between the models that we use and the, uh, the clinical problem that uh, we want to, 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 to solve. And then, of course, there is no distinct diagnostic code in the international classification of uh, diseases, which makes it harder uh, to try to understand what is cough to one person, what is throat clearing to another, and all that. Eh? And therefore, when we talk about cough, we are not talking uh, the same language. Uh, and then, of course, a, a drug makers a, have also only relied on maybe one or two clinical endpoints. Eh? And generally, this is 24-hour cohorts. And if you look at some of the, the, the a, you know, references that uh, you know, we have shared in this presentation, you'll actually be surprised that uh, maybe cough was measured for you know, maybe one week or two weeks. Uh, this is uh, uh, rather this outcome was actually only measured for a very limited amount of, of time. And then of course, there is that large placebo effect. And this has to do with the cortex, uh, a, you know, sort of modulating, uh, you know, the, the cough uh, uh, reflex, okay? So it has usually been very hard to, uh, to, 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 to get uh, a rid of, uh, a rid of that. Eh? Uh, so, uh, I think with your permission, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And I think maybe we'll be able to address any uh, questions much later. Uh, but really, thank you for, for your attention. Over, over to you, uh, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Edwin, for your very elaborative talk. I like how I to think about chronic hyper, hypersensitivity and chronic cough, the differences between them. So we do have a lot of question and answers, and I think um, we can probably do that before or after the, the topic from the people from Group of Sanofi. I don't know which one you would prefer. Um, Perry, Perry Osiko, would you prefer we do the Q&A before you do your session, your presentation? I would prefer if we finish. Are you ready so that you can do your presentation? Uh, uh, uh. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Is that um, Perry? I mean, I think I'm, uh, I'm okay. I'll, uh, I can do the presentation and then uh, kick you in there. Yeah, yeah. Different. Kindly, Perry. You might be addressing some of the questions from the audience. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll, handle, I'll handle the commercial bit. I'll go to product. Hoping my screen is visible to everyone. Yeah, it's quite visible. 
you can go ahead thank you yeah so on the commercial bit uh our, our target product which is relevant and comes into to cure the to give a cure to the much discussed topic uh by by doctor is uh, mikotolvan so in mikotolvan it gives a triple action against uh, chestikov so in indications where a patient presents himself with a thick sputum and uh, has issues to as as issues in terms of expectoration uh it comes in handy to dissolve the mucus to clear the mucus and uh, in totality to protect the lungs so we have a cl clinical study here on a co-administration of a active ingredient this is mucosolvan it's active ingredient and amoxicillin together with a amoxicillin together with the amoxicillin so it shows that uh, on, on co-administration co together with the uh, amoxicillin uh, the plasma levels of uh, of the of the of the amoxicillin is enhanced so it, it has a very good synergistic effect when when given together with antibiotics In essence, it's a triple action. It breaks down the mucus, liquefies and liquefies it. It facilitates expectoration and eliminates pathogens. And as, as I mentioned before, aids in penetration of antibiotics into the cellular tubes. So, in its mode of action, it's an anti effective effect. It facilitates penetration of antibiotics, as mentioned. It stimulates the production of immunoglobin A and stimulates secretion of uh, suffocants. So in, in essence, clearing the bronchial pathway by removing pathogenic organisms. That's an anti so this, is, this is a pictorial presentation of a uh, of stimulation of IgA. As I mentioned, it has a positive impact in IgA production. So lastly, we look at uh, dosage ac across the different uh, ages. So in terms of recommendation of dosage, we recommend from three years on, two three years of age, uh, 2.5 mils, which is given three times a day. Children from two to five years, uh, the recommended dosage is 2.5 to be given three times a day. And uh, six to 12 years, five mils, two to three times a day. Well, for adults, the recommended dosage is 10 mils three times a day. So this is a presentation, the particular presentation of the product. So in any indication where, 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 where there's a difficulty in expectoration, uh, it's a good product which has, it has stood the test of time, uh, which in essence you can be able to recommend. So that was precisely uh, the product which has sponsored uh, this discussion. So back to you, Amina, for the Q&A. So and I will be able to also answer questions in regard to which has tried directly associated to the product. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that brief uh, presentation. And for the audience, this is basically a sponsored, uh, sponsored uh, talk by Group Ethica. Um, so there's several questions to Dr. Tari. Uh, let me pick one particular person who has pointed out a comment he said about cough. It's not a entity disease entity but a scavenger why does it have risk factor it should have associations maybe you can expound on that and uh, also he has also asked about to explain the basis of lower esophageal sphincter and cough when you eat spicy food dr edwin Uh, yes, uh, thank you, and um, I'm I'm happy to to, to see my senior uh, Professor Lodge has logged in. Uh, uh, he has been our patron for quite a long time at uh, Resoc, and when it was come TLD, uh, so 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 that's a, I, I think those are those are very good uh, uh, questions. Uh, so 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 really for the uh, and and I actually recall a presentation that uh, I think a similar presentation that I had made. And I recall Professor Lodge uh, uh, mentioning the issue of the cough receptors that sometimes we do have uh, 
uh, you know, in the stomach and in the in the GIT. Uh, so it, it's an interesting issue because sometimes you do have, uh, uh, you are not able to, to demonstrate uh, a reflux and, and sometimes it is thought that even gas, reflux of gas, might actually be enough sufficient to, to activate these uh, vagal receptors. And actually something that has been shown is that, uh, you know, if you try to look for, you know, presence of a pepsin or a, a uh, you know, in, in, in the sp either sputum or saliva and all that, or uh, if you try to see whether, uh, you know, the, the, there is a reflux up to the uh, upper esophagus or the lower esophagus, it has actually been shown that it doesn't make a difference. And, and really the acid could act or, or the reflux mechanisms uh, could, could actually, they do not need to come into contact with, uh, uh, say, you know, the airway or the larynx and, and what have you. Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, interesting, but sometimes it is actually thought that uh, uh, there is also a cholinergic sort of uh, a reflex. So there is those uh, cough, cough receptors in, in the uh, GIT, low, you know, low esophagus as well as in the stomach, but there is also that cholinergic sort of uh, 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 reflex that is uh, uh, you know, due to the stimulation of the vagus nerve by uh, or those mechanisms, pathological mechanisms uh, uh, in, the, in, in the stomach. Eh? So this is interesting because sometimes even treatment of reflux does not uh, uh, solve the issue of the cough. Eh? Uh, and sometimes even if you're not able to demonstrate that uh, reflux by say pH impedance or uh, you know, demonstrate by esophageal manometry that there is this motility, uh, sometimes patients still do cough and sometimes the mechanism is still uh, accepted as, as, as reflux. So, so there is a, a, a lot of uh, difficulties in uh, trying to do studies, uh, just to look at the association of uh, that and, and uh, 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 the association of uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and, uh, and, and cough. So, so, so I think maybe that is what I would uh, I would, maybe I would say in answer to that, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I look forward to, to maybe just learning more from that. From, from, from. Uh, th thank you, back to you, Amina. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if you had addressed the first one. Uh, the one on cough is not a disease entity, but as Kevin, why should it have risk factors? It has association. But also, Nelson, maybe you can update Dr. Joseph to clarify on on this thought process. Uh, Professor, I'm sorry, I, but clearly I pointed out all your questions. Thank you. Hello? Doctor? Yes, you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Lodge. Uh, yes, you know, COVID has for a long time been uh, regarded merely, merely as a scavenger because obviously it's supposed to clear the respiratory tract whenever there's been some foreign bodies. So it's not really a disease, but it's rather uh, they call it a scavenger because it doesn't clear in the respiratory system. So it, it doesn't have risk factors as such, but it has association things that uh, when or occurs in the body, you do have uh, irritation that may cause cough. So you rather look at the diseases rather than uh, uh, look at the risk factor that causes the disease that will irritate the respiratory system or the cough, uh, the cough receptors. Uh, you know, and, and of course, you also know that the cough is also got a psychological uh, element. For example, if you want to draw somebody's attention, you cough. That type of cough is completely different. So you don't call it a disease really. That is just kind of a, a way of communication. Or, uh, but for many years, uh, it is shown clearly that uh, a lot of uh, cough doesn't need any treatment, particularly in, in children. It very shows clearly that sometimes time is the best treatment uh, uh, for cough. And uh, as you uh, say later on, I say that. Uh, what you did stress on is that the COVID and asthma is a very significant uh, uh, element, particularly in children, where most of the asthmatic uh, children present with only cough. There will be no quiz, 
uh, they are not classed by a track. And uh, most um, uh, informed doctors will just give you the cough mixture uh, one after the other, year in, year out, and forget it to give them the proper inhalers which may relieve the asthmatic attack. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Dr. Edwin, do you have any, any response or addition? Uh, my, much obliged. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof, for, for those remarks. Uh, so the next question is uh, the allergic type of cough, which, which is dry in nature and subsided uh, by cetrizine, comes back as soon as you stop antihistamine. How, how do you treat this? Dr. Uh, yes, so, yeah, so th 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 thank, thank you very much, uh, you know, Dr. Ali, for, for that question. So, and, and we do, we do get, uh, you know, we, we do attribute a lot of uh, cough and, and really lots of, uh, uh, you know, these uh, respiratory symptoms to, to allergy. And in some cases, we've not really demonstrated that, uh, you know, the, the, our patients are, are maybe allergic uh, uh, what they're allergic to and, and uh, you know, whether really the, the allergy is present. Uh, and, and definitely, of course, the, the antihistamines, I think as, as we've uh, uh, seen, uh, they also do have a, you know, a central uh, mechanism of action as well. And, and really that's why they do cause, uh, you know, the traditional ones, uh, you know, are quite sedating. Uh, so uh, I think maybe what I'd say is that, you know, it is very important to, to refer these uh, uh, patients who do not respond to these uh, uh, therapies, which we might call first line. It is really essential to, to, to refer them uh, to, to specialists. So we do have, uh, you know, now quite a number of uh, uh, pediatric as well as say, uh, uh, you know, adult uh, lung specialists, uh, maybe not as many as we would hope to, to, to have if you, if you look at uh, uh, the population that they have to serve, uh, given that, uh, you know, the, the respiratory symptoms are quite common. But I think the quick answer really is, please refer these patients uh, early enough eh, uh, so that a full evaluation uh, can, can be undertaken. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, I also uh, cannot agree more. And in line with that, there's uh, another question by, by Maureen Ojua. She's asking about an elderly man who's 84 years with excessive elevation and mucoid sputum for over a period of one year. If B test is negative, what can you recommend for such a patient? So, Dr. over to you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll basically, and, and thank you for that question, uh, Maureen. And, and what, what I really I do is uh, go uh, to the algorithm that I, that I shared and just take it uh, you know, through those uh, steps. And, and, and really at that age, and, and this reminds me of a patient that we saw uh, recently at uh, you know, Kiambu level five, where we, we, we you know, train uh, you know, our students. And, and really, you know, this is somebody who is in his forties and uh, you know, he said to have you know, new onset asthma. Uh, or of course, anything can, uh, you know, can sort of you know, happen at any age, but the likelihood of that is, uh, you know, is quite low because you know the, the phenotype that we associate with uh, uh, maybe late onset asthma is in females uh, in particular, and therefore sometimes you do sort of, uh, uh, you know, feel that uh, there is something that you missed out. In fact, the patients themselves do not truly, you know, they they do express that they are not fully satisfied. Uh, with uh, that uh, uh, diagnosis. And I think at 84, there are those diagnoses that uh, probably we, we will be watchful for. Uh, we are really quite watchful for, you know, are there malignant uh, causes at, at, at play here? Uh, you know, has there been, you know, so much exposure to, uh, you know, the, uh, tobacco, other the sort of uh, uh, harmful uh, substances and what have you? Uh, so, so there's, Quite a lot of evaluation to do uh, uh, based on uh, what is more likely uh, at, at, at that age. So I don't think I could give a comprehensive answer uh, uh, right now. 
uh, but really just to follow the, 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 the algorithm step, step by step. Eh? And just to recall that uh, the, the common causes are the ones that we highlighted, maybe 50 to 90%. Uh, you know, the, that triad of those four D. Yeah, I, I, I agree more. And also okay. to- and that to... Page, Yes, comorbidity at that age, you know, do they have heart failure? What is bronchial, yeah, sorry, Dr. Is bronchi bronchiectasis common in that age group? Yeah, so so really bronchiectasis, the, the picture we see bronchiectasis and maybe as part of the post B lung disease, which is really now an entity that is garnering a lot of attention, is generally people who are much, much younger than that. Eh? Oh. But uh, definitely bronchiectasis could also be, be, be at play, uh, depending on what sort of uh, uh, you know, exposures and uh, damage that uh, these uh, airways have, have, have faced. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tari. And uh, also, I guess we can continue augmenting, refer, refer the patient to the appropriate specialist. Um, uh, another attendee is asking, what, are, what is the recommended dosage for pregabalin and gabapen or gabapentin for treatment uh, and treatment duration for cough hypersensitivity syndrome? Uh, yes, so I, I, I think really uh, suffice to say this, these drugs have not really, uh, you know, un undergone uh, very good uh, clinical trials. Uh, most of their use for these conditions is, uh, I, 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 yeah, maybe, maybe somebody might might call it uh, a bit, uh, it's, it's a bit of label. And, and unfortunately, the cough does a, a come back, but for gabapentin doses up to, uh, 1800 milligrams have been tried. Of course, the higher you go, then the, the, the more the, the likelihood of uh, side effects. Eh? So usually yeah. people try to, to operate at uh, lower dose, dose ranges and, and really doses from, uh, you know, maybe 600 milligrams per day are probably the ones most commonly used, 300 milligrams twice a day. But of course, uh, being a GABA agonist, then uh, you know the, the issues to do with the drowsiness, in you know imbalance, uh, etc., uh, tend also to be quite uh, quite common. So in a way, higher doses are not tolerated by by, by patients, eh? and that's why uh, you know in such cases, uh, low dose tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, actually a dose of ten milligrams, which we do not find locally, which is quite interesting. And maybe the lowest that we are able to find even at a, a Nairobi hospital is, uh, you know, the, the 25 that we can break into 12.5. Eh? So generally, a metriptyline low dose, the, the dose that's recommended is usually 10 milligrams at night. And, and at that low dose, that is found to be tolerated. But just remember, when you stop these therapies, then, then the cough is also likely to, uh, to, to, to come back. So again, this really takes us back to the issue that these patients should indeed uh, be, uh, you know, followed up in a cough uh, specialist uh, center, where there is also emphasis on trying to identify what other risk factors there might be and trying mm. to uh, uh, tackle these risk factors. Good. Um, so uh, in what of injectable antitussives? I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by it because I've never heard of one. So I, I, I don't know. Uh, what, what is available in the market and are they useful? Uh, Professor Olocha has asked. Uh, yes, so I think that's an interesting question. I, I am not uh, aware of any. This is something that I have to, to, to go and, uh, and, and have a look at. But if we, we looked at like the central acting, the, the opiates, uh, they, they can be given, they, they are also effective uh, uh, parentally, but that's not how you want to, uh, to, 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 to give them. But I'm not aware of, uh, you know, any, uh, and, you know, specific antitussives that, that are effective. Yeah, I, I'm actually interested to hear this. Professor, do, do you can enlighten us. Professor, I hope you can still unmute. Yeah, I, I mean that 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 might actually be something worth. Uh, uh, 
we used to have for a long time uh, mucolytics we are injected with, not adhesive, but so so called mucolytic agent like by solvent for a long time. We are injected from. I uh, used to be given in ICU in particular, and everybody will query the basis of it because somebody is in ICU on a ventilator, there has no cough re reflex. So, how on earth is uh, injectable mucolytic going to work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is like this. I'm sure Dr. Mugabe must have used it, or maybe you're too young for those. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like probably it's it's out of practice, but uh, I, still a lot of people are asking on the opinion on um, cough uh, antitussives on children. I'm particularly interested in hearing the answer to this because do we give uh, or not? Actually, it's a million dollar question. What's, what's your opinion on that? I and large, okay, like everything, but by and large, uh, but the children under the age of five really should avoid as much as possible so-called the cough medicine. Unfortunately, the doctors are the worst because they're the ones who have uh, uh, taught children, I mean, the mothers that whenever your child coughs, uh, they prescribe medicine. So the thing is so entrenched in the, in the mother's uh, uh, mind that if you tell them not to give many cough medicine, they wonder whether you're a serious doctor. Same thing goes with the antibiotic. Whenever a child coughs, they go to a pediatrician, most pediatricians will prescribe antibiotic and a cough mixture. So the doctors have really messed the field very much. But uh, if you should say, not only is it necessary, but it's dangerous and can be fatal. And this is even uh, com common knowledge, even in the lay press, even the uh, local newspaper. They keep writing about the dangers of uh, cough mixture in children. And this has been going on for many years. And still, uh, the doctors keep prescribing them without any evidence that they're so useful. So I think the, the fault is the doctors, not so much the public. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Eric, Dr. Eric? Yes, thanks, 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 Prof. I, I think really Prof has summarized that uh, uh, very well. Uh, I, I, I have nothing to add, uh, you know, at the risk of diluting uh, that good message. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, guys, Mumetikia, no, no antitussives, you know, I, I, with uh, with young children. But then, actually, I can tell you this for sure. It's so hard, even being as a doctor, as a parent, because you'd find even your 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 other partner bringing those cough syrups against your <laughs> your wish. But thank you very much, Professor, for that uh, elaboration. Um. So. I think we've covered majority of the things. Um, Simon had asked, he had two questions. Uh, this one was pertaining middle age patients presenting with non-productive long-standing cough. What's your comment on these patients? So middle age patients uh, with non-productive long-standing cough, what do you think? And they have negative gene expert. I think we all check gene expert rule out TB with cough. Uh, so in that scenario, what do, what do we do? Dr. Yes, I think really. Th th thank you, thank you, Doctor, for for that uh, uh, question, and and I think really this fits well into what we are talking about. But I, I just want to say for for these uh, uh, patients who have these uh, long standing uh, you know symptoms, it is very important to, to try to check you know are they are they losing weight? Uh, really, just going back to, to to the basics, just to try to. Uh, to make sure that there is nothing that you've, you've, you've overlooked. And then also to try to look at, uh, because sometimes we do forget to take uh, occupational history. Uh, definitely we know that uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, conditions such as asthma that we know can be worsened uh, by, by occupational history. We know that uh, uh, you know, we can get these uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, you know, sort of flaring. Uh, sometimes we also forget to ask about uh, pets and, and hobbies. Well, sometimes somebody's hobbies or the sort of pets that they, they keep I, you know, are related to, to, to their symptoms. And, and really, if we are not able to uh, identify anything, I think these are the patients really that we are talking about uh, 
uh, an aberrant uh, uh, cough reflex. And uh, these are the ones now who fit under uh, this uh, uh, words, you know, this uh, diagnosis that I talked about. So we, we could have the chronic refractory cough. Uh, we could also have the unexplained cough. Uh, chronic cough, where you know the mechanism is thought to be that uh, you know there might have been injury to to one of the uh, you know branches of uh, the, the, the vagus uh, nerve. Uh, there could be issues with those receptors, and and therefore mm -hmm. you you do tend to get uh, you know aberrant firing of these action potentials uh, at all times. So really, these are the patients who fit into this uh, discussion very well. And I think really the thing to do is uh, really just make sure that we do send them uh, to, to, to the highest level in the, in the uh, you know, sort of referral uh, network. Eh? Um, so, so that would be my comment, uh, Amina. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I believe uh, occupational history you know it's is the biggest take home message for me personally uh let's do a thorough occupational history especially with people with chronic cough it's not purely infection we always like thinking infection but sometimes it can be triggered by our environment um simon still is asking about he also has another case of a 65 year old patient with non-stopping cough that's worse with swallowing food uh, comment on the same and recommendation for such. Is it the same as what Dr. Professor Loach had asked earlier? If do you think there's a relation? Over to you. Over to you, Dr. Eric. Yes, 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 Amina. So we, with the age, I, I think really sometimes the approach that I have found useful is sometimes uh, just trying to, to roll out what a uh, uh, might be dangerous if you missed it. Eh? So really based on those symptoms and the age, I would actually just want to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, you know, respiratory tract as well as uh, the, the esophagus, that, you know, those are quite clear. Uh, that would be very important uh, uh, for me to do and really just to rule out, uh, you know, is there some uh, might, might, might there be you know, malignancy that are missing out. Uh, again, exposures, just remember comor comorbid conditions. Uh, sometimes we do have a heart failure that's not typical. Eh? And, and therefore these patients do require a, a, you know, a full evaluation. Uh, in reality, sometimes you do have to refer them to the ENT specialist. Uh, you do have to refer them to the uh, gastroenterologist. Uh, you know, just a, a to 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 have uh, that 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 sort of evaluation. So so and unfortunately we do not have as as you realize most of the uh, conditions that cause cough. Uh, the way to go about them is to try to identify an underlying condition and really try to make sure that you have uh, addressed that. Eh? Uh, just just remember that cough on its own as a target. I think as a, a professor has also. Uh, you know, uh, 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 reminded us that uh, you know it is it 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 is not really a, a disease on its own. Eh? So so it it is usually something that tells us that uh, there is something going on, eh? and and therefore really the emphasis is to to, to really just go back and try to uh, you know identify an, an underlying cause. If we are not able to do that before, we call it an explained cough. Or uh, you know, before the patient is uh, you know maybe sent for uh, you know, so sometimes a small hernia, hiatus hernia is discovered, and we have seen these patients who uh, you know they they are you know they are being pushed to go and have the hernia repaired, but sometimes we are certain that uh, you know that will be repaired, but but you know the cough will you know might still remain. Eh? So I think really in those in those cases full evaluation, and then let us just utilize the the, the referral. Uh, process uh, in, in, in a better way. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Um, there's uh, also some questions from anonymous attendees. Uh, one is asking to differentiate between antibiotic and antibacterial agents. Uh, and illustrate with an example in context of cough management. What's the difference between antibiotic and antibacterial agent? 
Over to you, Dr. Uh, okay, so that uh, really sounds to be out of uh, ph pharmacology class. Uh, and uh, I might not be best place to, to refer to that, but really antibiotics, uh, uh, you know, when, when that uh, term, terminology was coined, I generally referred to these agents that, uh, you know, were, were natural agents. Uh, and that really, you, you know, if you remember penicillin, are produced by, you know, fungus. And so, so generally, very strictly, that was a... a, a how the, the terminology was coined. But of course, we know that now most of uh, the, the agents we use are synthetic agents. Eh? And, and therefore, this broader term of uh, uh, antibacterial agents, I think, is what is now uh, in, in common use. Eh? So I, I think, really, for me, that is my, my understanding. But again, a disclaimer that uh, uh, this is a bit out of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the context uh, that, that I focused on today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari. We have many questions, but in the interest of time, we cannot address all of them. I cannot say we are honored and uh, humbled to have you here in the platform. Thank you for educating us. To the sponsor, Group Ethica, thank you very much for uh, sponsoring the, 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 the talk today. Um, for Professor, Professor, thank you for joining in and sharing in your wisdom. Uh, to the audience, we highly appreciate your time and your efforts. Uh, for the CPD points for KMPDC, we normally give them in two weeks. For the nurses, we, uh, we give them uh, as, uh, as per day, we email them as well. For PPB, you will be emailed within two weeks uh, session, when the sessions are uploaded uh, on the PPD website, so kindly subscribe there. I think one of the biggest uh, issues are uh, that particular CADA. Uh, for clinical officers, note that the attendance list for each session are sent to the council and token awarded from the portal. So kindly, uh, for inquiries, kindly contact KNHCPD. Uh, the NCK, uh, it will be emailed and the token expires within 48 hours. So for the people complaining about expiry, probably that's the reason why, because it expires within 48 hours. If I may come in uh, concerning the CPDs, especially for PPB, yes, uh, we've uploaded all sessions to the portal, yes. uh, all yes. previous sessions, so they can go ahead and subscribe to the sessions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we will be sending out the CPDs much later this week for all of the sessions that uh, the, you have attended. So please subscribe so that you can be mm -hmm. awarded the tokens. Yeah, many, many apologies to the pharmacy uh, group. Uh, it has been one of the hardest things to be able, and thank you, Nelson, for facilitating and team and Emmanuel and everybody else. So um, for the pharmacist, uh, thank you for bearing with us, and uh, hopefully this issue would have resolved perhaps completely. So thank you very much for logging in and listening in for any inquiries. As Nelson has pointed out, there's the... Uh, email which is purely for cpd you can ask knhcpd at, gym, uh, at gmail at uh, gmail.com uh, tomorrow the session we are having with the ministry of health uh, regarding healthcare systems uh, and uh, digi the digital health platform series it's going to be a series focusing on interoperable interoperability please log in listen to what the ministry is doing uh, in the digital health space this is for everybody and for us to share the knowledge uh, far and beyond. So again, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. Uh, Dr. Frank, maybe you wanted to say something before we go? <laughs> no, I just wanted to, to, to say thank you to the KNH and to also to you, uh, Dr. Gulit. Thank you for, uh, to Dr. Mugambi and all the team in Nairobi. Uh, I hope I will have the pleasure to see you when I will be there uh, by tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Professor. Bye, Bye. Eric. Bye, everyone. Hey, everyone. <laughs>